Welcome to Glenmar's Mission Weekend. Um, if you've been on any of the Hurley trips the past five years, you might know who I am. For those that don't, my name is Chana Taka. I'm sure you probably know my two daughters, though. Delaney and Reese, they often sing at the 11 o'clock praise service. Um, I'm a mission board member here at Glenmar, and as such, I have the privilege of setting the stage for some wonderful speakers today who will share their mission experiences. But before I introduce the first speaker, I would like everyone to think about a turning point they've experienced in their life. Everybody has one. There are well-known historic examples like Rosa Park deciding she just wasn't going to sit in the back of the bus anymore. Most turning points are much less public and far-reaching, but nevertheless, just as profound. It could be as simple as a member of church, a member of church asking your daughter to go on a mission trip because two of his crew members dropped out at the last minute. As this church member continued his plea, okay, I'm just going to throw him under the bus. It was Al Hannigan. He usually plays guitar at the 11 o'clock. I said, Al, my husband Tony and I, we just usually don't send our kids nine hours away for a week with relatively complete strangers. So that would mean you're probably going to get one of us to go along. He was like, even better. That's when I started to chuckle. I was like, yeah, Al, you think that's great because you're assuming Tony is going to be the one going with Delaney. You know, my husband who knows most things construction. But I said, no, Al, I would be the one going with Delaney because Tony does landscaping and it's June, his busy season. Al said, no, no, that would be wonderful because, quote, mothers are golden on a Hurley trip. I was like, yeah, you say that now, buddy. But we agreed to go. So for two weeks, I just kept thinking, what have I gotten myself into? So helping others, check. I can do that. We got this. Working outside in the June heat, eh, not really a fan. Doing construction with absolutely no skills, probably not a good thing. Having to meet a bunch of new people and be social, do I really have to? All right, so as you guessed, Delaney and Reese get their outgoing personalities from my husband, not so much me. And finally, spending an extra week with a bunch of teenagers when I just finished my 20th year of teaching middle school. <laughs> Lord, I think you're trying to kill me here. Yeah. Hmm. But Delaney and I went to Hurley, and it was a turning point for us. It was a tremendous blessing for my family. Delaney and I have gone on five trips together. Reese has joined us the past two. And I can truthfully say that these mission trips have been the best experiences I really have ever had with my daughters. We came back changed as a result of the community that we served, the relationships that we've built, and the work that we were a part of there. The theme of this year's mission weekend is blessed to be a blessing. And it really is true. You might think you are participating to help and bless others, but by the end of the experience, the blessings you have received far exceeds what you have given. As we heard in the sermon last week, reflecting on also today's scripture, Abram experienced a major turning point. God asked him to just have faith and go. If Abram would obey God's call, God would make of him a great nation and bless him so that he would in turn be a blessing. God reached out to Abram and God reaches out to all of us, blessing us and seeking relationships with us. So we can bless, so we can then bless and love others. Most of the time, we don't think we can do this because we don't think we have what it takes. But the reality is, God has already provided everything that we need. And our job is to acknowledge that, get going, and do the work. 
That's what serving the, war, the world at Glenmar is all about. This church, all of us as individuals, we are so fortunate to be able to do what we want to do and meet the people that we meet. Today, you have an opportunity to hear from people who have been touched by the blessing of service. It might be the mission tripper or the homeowner, day shelter volunteer or day shelter guest, volunteer tutor or student, bed builder or deep sleeper, and so many more. And while some serve and while some receive, it takes all of us to build relationships, to reflect God's love to each other and to help each other grow. Today's speakers will give you an example of this amazing circle of service by sharing their stories with you and even get you possibly to consider joining one of the mission opportunities, even going to Hurley, because mothers are golden and we need a couple more. Good evening, Glenmar. My name is Zelda Fun. Um, and I am a first-time homeowner of a Habitat home. It was sponsored by Glenmar. And I'd like to say thank you. It has been 13 years, bless God. But our friendship is still strong. Um, first, I'd like to talk about um, where I see God working. I see him working everywhere in everything and working in me because he needs to make some changes and I have come to the point where I'm accepting that and I'm making peace with that. Um, he's made me humble. He's made me kinder. He's made me more patient. And these are the qualities that I believe he wants from me. Okay. Um, he's calling me to be a servant, and through my home, I believe I am. Um, when I moved on Fulton Avenue, um, I got to move, meet my neighbors. They are wonderful. In spite of the bad reputation of Sandtown, there are some wonderful people there. Very friendly, very protective. And I now work for University of Maryland as a community health worker, and I go out in the community and do everything I can to help others um, with their help, with the, for their health and the way that they live, living better. Um, and I love it. I love it. We have a mobile market and I take food to my neighbors. Hopefully they will accept it. If they don't, I don't feel bad, but I respect that. But if they do, I just bless them and let them enjoy. Um, my Habitat house, I want to get back to that. Um, when I started, I filled out an application. There was a long line of people. And I filled out my application. I think I was the second one in line because I finally was convinced to um, apply. I always said I didn't want a home. I didn't want that responsibility. But God sometimes sends angels in your life to help you. And Elder Harris and Mrs. Harris were my angels at that time. And I filled out the application and got all my paperwork together. And once I finished that, I went for the interview. I was nervous, like I am now, but <laughs> it's all good. Um, and I answered a lot of their questions, and then came the waiting. It wasn't too long, because I hear that some people have to wait years. I waited about maybe six months. And then I went um, to see the two houses that I wanted to choose from, and I chose 1343. And that's where I met my friends. <laughs> I enjoyed every Saturday that I went. I was up bright and early with them. When they ate lunch, I went home. And as soon as I finished, I came right back because I wanted to get all my hours in that I had, because they required us to do a certain amount of hours. And uh, we were also required to put down a down payment, but they gave us enough time to make payments, which was good. Um, I finished everything I had to do. Um, I even helped other people with their homes, um, and that helped my hours too. 
um, my next door neighbor, um, Elder Harris and Mrs. Harris, their son lives next door to me. And that's pretty fun. I also helped with the neighbors next door to them and next door to them. So it was, it's been a pleasure. Um, haven't seen a lot of busyness from Habitat until recently. And that was very exciting, Bob. I was, I was very glad for you to invite me here. Um, God is just moving in a wonderful way. And I have not given up on my neighborhood. I will not give up on my neighborhood. Um, the people who live next door to me on either side and around the corner, we are our homeowners now. We are proud. We're going to stay that way. And we are determined that our community is going to be good. So I'd like to say thank you, Glenmore. You made such a big, big help for me, and I will never forget it. And at any other time you need me to come, as nervous as I am, I will be glad to come and speak to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Asai Roberts. I'm 12 years old, and I'm in the seventh grade. I go to Connections Middle High School in Baltimore City. Um, I like my media class and my math class. Um, what else? I like to be on Instagram and do online shopping, and I like to read. I say my favorite book right now is Little Girl Lost, and it's basically a novel about a girl around my age who has a stressful life and go through things, but the outcome of it is great. Let's see. Um, I've been in college prep for about four years now. And I remember, well, you see that picture right there? That's when I first signed up for college prep at the exact moment. Um, let's see. I was at camp, and it was a carnival down the street. And then we went, and it was a lot of activities, a lot of stuff to do. But it was just this one particular stand that caught my eye, which was that one right there. And I went up to Papa John, he had his warm and smile, and he started telling me what college and career prep was. And I just thought it would be a great opportunity for me to do. Um, let's see. I tell a lot of people about college prep at my school, and they all, they be like, oh, that sound boring and stuff. But college prep, it, it provides a lot of opportunities and things for you to do. It helps me come outside my box. Like, some stuff that I did at college prep, I don't think I would never do in my entire life. But pop him right there. <laughs> Let me see. Um, like I was talking about about great experiences. I remember we went to the Towson game last year, and um, I got to talk to some of the student government leaders. I got to dance with the football dancers. Um, I took pictures with this professional photographer, camera. His Papa John just thinks it's so amazing. And yeah, I learned a lot on the field trip. I learned stuff like what I have to do in life to get where I want to go. And it's going to be a lot of bumps in the road, but you got to keep pushing and get where you want to go. Um, I know I drive a lot of people crazy at college prep because I'm hard-headed and I don't listen. But they managed to deal with it, and I appreciate every single one of them. Um, yeah. When I first started college prep, since I first started college prep, I've been jumping from volunteer to volunteer. So I had to work with change, and I had to work with getting along with people like Miss Nancy, who drives me, um, who picks me up every Tuesday and drops me off. Miss Bonnie, who I'm working with right now. Also, Mr. Stefan, I'm working with right now, and other volunteers at college prep. College prep is very important to me. If I did, if it college prep wasn't important to me, I wouldn't keep coming back. Cause I'm, I don't know. Um, let's see. College prep helps me change for the better. Like in the summertime, I told Papa John and some of the other volunteers how I was going to change my attitude around this year. How I was going to start hanging out with better people. And I think I'm really doing a good job at that. Right now, in my classes, I think. I'm, I'm passing all my classes right now. And I would say last year, I really wasn't doing too good. But during the summertime, I had a lot of talks with the volunteers. And they told me how, how I'm a good person. It's just that I have a bad attitude. But I'm getting there. Um, 
what else? Through these experiences, I've been learning a lot about God and what I need to do to serve him. I've been trying to go to church every Sunday, so I think that's a good thing. And that's really about it. Um, but yeah, college prep is really a good, it's just really good. The volunteers are great. There are a lot of awesome kids with issues who could use your help at college prep. If I wasn't going to college prep, I probably wouldn't be doing as good as school as I am now. And thanks to the pro college prep volunteers, I'm on a good track and I have a bright feature. Thank you guys for being a great audience and listening to my stories. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Eloise Labrum, as Rod, Rob said. Um, I have been a Glenmar member for over 20 years. I'm in, a member of the mission board, and I'm involved in a number of mission opportunities. Um, in fact, in the last couple of weeks, I have been um, cleaning a house for helping homelessness Howard County. I've been planning for day of service by prepping supplies. I have been um, um, cutting, um, sanding wood for sleep in heavenly peace. My fall passion isn't really any of those, but is Operation Christmas Child, and you can see all the shoe boxes already stacked up outside. Um, we call them gospel opportunities, so that um, children around the world have the opportunity to hear the gospel message and receive a gift. Um, so th that's not why I'm up here this morning. <laughs> I've, uh, I've been on over 20 mission trips with Glenmar in the last 10 years, and I love getting to work with our youth, getting to know the homeowners. Most of them have been construction trips, um, but not all of them. I have, um, didn't have a lot of construction experience when I went on my first trip, and I thought, well, what am I going to do? I know I'm good at talking to people, so I figured my role was to talk to the homeowner, get the youth to talk to the homeowner, and to get my partner um, involving the youth um, and getting, you know, making everybody work together and that kind of thing. Well, over the years, I've gotten a little bit of experience with construction and um, with guidance I can put on a roof and build a shed and all those kinds of things. Um, Baltimore is different, though. In our Baltimore trip, um, you, you don't really have homeowners, per se. You go to different mission opportunities. And this past summer, I was in Baltimore with a crew serving at Helping Up Mission. Helping Up Mission, when you first go there, we got a tour of the facility, and um, the tour was given by one of the residents. The facility is a uh, recovery place. They're recovering from either addiction or um, alcohol. And it's a one-year program, and they come, and for the first few months, they're not really allowed out of the building. Um, they're given jobs in the building. Some do laundry, some do cleaning, some do cooking, um, and all that kind of stuff. They have clothes to wear, but they're not allowed a closet like I have at home. <laughs> I have way too many clothes, as probably most of you do, too. Um, they only have a couple sets, a few sets of clothing to wear. Um, the youth, we were there to serve food at lunchtime, and um, the youth, it was the second day of the trip. The youth were um, not really talking to people outside of the group yet, and so the opportunities were to serve food, put stuff on people's plates as they come through the line, um, or go out and sit at a table and talk to people. Now, you know which one I chose, and you know which ones most of the, the rest of the group all wanted to be on the serving line and serve people. Um, some, some of the people at the table I sat down, they were pretty new to the program, and so they were just learning about what life was like there. A couple of them, there were like four or five, six people at the table, and they, you come and you finish your meal, and then you go, and then another person comes and sits down. So um, they came, they were just talking. We were, you know, how long have you been here? What do, that kind of thing. They were so appreciative that we were there serving them, um, realizing that it was out of, 
our people's comfort zone to even be in a place like that. Um, the people were not scary at all. Some of them had um, decorations on their skin, but they were really not scary. They were very grateful to have us there, and they were telling me how much they appreciated having people get out of their comfort zone to come in and serve them. And um, they wanted me to take it back to tell everyone. Um, so one of the guys at the table got up to um, get a refill on his drink. And um, he turned around and started to walk away. And I said, oh, I like the saying on the back of your shirt. And so he turned around and he said, really? Do you want it? And I said, no, no, no. I can't take your shirt. <laughs> And besides, it was a cafeteria full of people, mostly men. There were a few women, because they worked in the building, and we had teenage girls on our serving crew. And I was like, no, please don't take your shirt off. And he said, are you sure? And he lifted his shirt again. I said, no, no, no. So we got a drink refill and came back. And, um, and we chit-chatted a little bit more. And then he got up and he took his tray to the dish thing that you take your trays to. And he came back around the other side of me. And there was a pole there, and I couldn't see him all that well. So he was over here, and he said, really, do you want my shirt? No, no. Now, um, the shirt says, what else can we do for you? And I thought, you know, as mission people, sometimes we think, that that's why we're here. What can I do for you? What can I, how can I serve you? What can I do for you? But it's about more than that. For him offering me his shirt was just a little bit mind-blowing. Um, so as he was standing on this side of the table, I said, no, no, really, I don't need your shirt. I have plenty at home. So what do you think he did? He took off the shirt set it on the table, turned around, and walked out the door. I don't remember if I even had a chance to say thank you, because my initial reaction was I was embarrassed that he would not only take off his shirt and walk out of here without a shirt on, but he has so little. He can't just go and get another set of clothes from the store. I have so much. I don't really need another shirt. But as I thought about it, he doesn't have the opportunity to serve like I do. He was serving me by giving me his shirt. So I was truly humbled by that. After I got over the embarrassment, I was truly humbled. Um, he probably doesn't get the opportunity to help other people very often. Um, I got over him being embarrassed. He had a chance to bless me with his shirt. And I humbly wear that shirt today with the saying. It was, you know, it must have been a God moment because the shirt fits me. So I knew I had to wear it. We're called to live in community and to love one another. How many of you have had someone give you the shirt off your back. Thank you for listening to my story. All right, um, hello, my name is Terrence Perry. Um, this isn't my first speech. I've actually done two other speeches, so this is my third one. I'm from the College and Career Prep Program, and today I'm gonna to be telling you guys about my early experience and how it changed me. So, I've actually So I've actually been wanting to go to the Hurley trip since sixth grade, and I finally got my chance to go, and it was actually very amazing. I actually loved it very much. And um, so there was a lot of different God moments. So, so yeah, it was an amazing experience from working on two tent roofs and completing them both with my amazing crew that Rob Boyle was a part of. Um, but also from riding around in Mr. Bird's classic 1990 Chevy. As me and him were driving around, on, driving to our job site, 
he showed me around his town and he showed me his house where he grew up at as a boy and he showed me where he works at um, as a firefighter today, actually. He's still a fighter fighter, so that's pretty cool. Um, all right, so, but yeah, um, also driving around with Mr. Bird, you know, I felt like I was driving in the past because the town was, because the Hurley town is like very, not, it's like not up to date. It's very old school. Um, um, an example from that is, you know, we, we stopped at a gas station for gas and the, and the gas pumps, you know, it was just a standardized two pumps like back in the day, you know, like the little two gas pumps. That was just it. It wasn't like four or five of them. So, yeah, um, that's an example of how the town felt old school. But, you know, just seeing so many different things, you know, like driving past coal mines, you know, seeing the mountains, you know, houses, not a lot of technology like we live in today. So, you know, that's how it felt like, you know, very old school. Um, so this brings me to my next point that after spending quite some time in Hurley, um, I realized that Hurley was very different from where I had grown up at in Baltimore City. You know, um, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a modern town with, other, with up-to-date technology and stuff, and they are just happy with that. Like, they don't really care. They don't gotta have the brand new technology, like brand new flat screen TVs in their living room or nothing. They just live good, you know. Um, so they're like a family down there. They don't have a lot of stuff and what they do have, they share together. Um, I saw how they was a family at, the, um, at, that, um, at that community cookout. The community cookout, you know, it was like pretty much everybody from Hurley down there. Um, they, all, they were all smiling, they were all happy. They, just, they were just happy, they were happy with what they had. And that just made me smile. And I shed a couple of tears, cause you know, in Baltimore, we also don't really have that much stuff, but they actually, they get through it together, unlike us in Baltimore City. So, yeah. So, the cookout backs up that claim. Um, also, Hurley isn't just a place, it's the people, it's the community. They work together, they get through it together, they just share, with the, they share what they got, and yeah, that's pretty much it. So, thank you all for, thank you all for listening to my story of transformation. Hope you all have a wonderful week. Um, good morning. Uh, Glamour, my name is Amy Barnes, and I am here to answer the question, to what is God calling us? Um, to which I would answer, God is calling us to experience his joy and to experience that joy fully. Last week, Pastor Mandy's scripture reading, which is also our scripture reading from today, is Genesis chapter 12, um, to which I have always referred to as the Pastor Andy passage. Um, I guess now I need to refer to it as the Pastor's Andy and Mandy passage. Um, I refer to Genesis chapter 12 as the Pastor Andy passage because it is the only thing I remember from his sermons. I remember it because I only had to remember two words, so and that. God tells Abraham that God will bless him so that Abraham can be a blessing. So to what is God calling us? As Pastor Mandy reminded us last week, God called Abraham and Moses and Isaiah so that they could be a blessing. God calls us, too, to be blessings so that we can experience his joy. The Gospel of John tells the story of the vine and the branches. In the 15th chapter, verse 11, Jesus tells his disciples that he tells them this story of the vine and the branches for a reason, so that Jesus' joy might be our joy and that our joy may be wholly mature. So to what is God calling us? Joy, his joy. He's calling us so that we might wholly experience his joy. When we arrived at our work site in Tarboro, North Carolina, I was excited. I looked forward to the wind in my hair, the sun on my skin, the adventure of replacing a roof. It would be a great joy, I couldn't wait. Just as I strapped on my trusty nail apron, our work site coordinator, Jeff, walked directly up to me, looked me straight in the eye, and rather pointedly asked, who would, to re who would like to replace the insulation under the house? <laughs> Not surprisingly, all of our crew members were silent and began shuffling away. I looked over at what I would generously call a roll space rather than a crawl space and tighten my nail apron. Our coordinator, Jeff, was undeterred. You look like you'd be willing to go under there, Jeff said. I do? I thought, because I have my nail apron and my hammer and my nails and my safety goggles, I'm ready to go on the roof. 
We've got hazmat suits for you, Jeff said, clearly assuming I had already agreed to the job. Hazmat suits, DuPont Tyvek? You're joking, right? Jeff smiled, but did not seem to take my lack of enthusiasm as a solid no. Here's the insulation and the pins, Jeff continued. All you got to do is put it up between the boards. It was clear that Jeff had previously convinced some other poor soul to crawl under the house and remove the ruined insulation. He was not giving up. My silence was just not getting through to him. Before I could tell him that I suffer from claustrophobia, which isn't true, but seemed like a good excuse, he handed me the DuPont Tyvek suit. I cringed. It's dark in there. It's damp and scary in there. There's just not a lot of room in there. Reluctantly, I took the suit and slowly put it on. Showing great pity, our fearless leader, Al, handed me a large lamp. At least there would be some light. Now fully guarded from the wet, muddy earth in my Tyvek suit, I saw a member, another member of our team suiting up. I didn't know who he was, but he couldn't be that bad if he was also guilted into crawling into the abyss. Once under the house, I grumbled, why can't I be on the roof? The air up there is fresh. The air down here is muggy and sewagey. I know people up there. I do not know this fellow has matter. Roofing is sociable and fun. This will be lonely and boring. But despite my reluctance to do what Jeff, or God speaking through Jeff, had called me to do, my emotions quickly shifted from disgust to complete joy. My new work coworker and I worked splendidly together. The work wasn't difficult. It was a puzzle. It was, dare I say, fun. Then a third member of our team joined in, perhaps because he felt guilty, perhaps because he had been nagged, or perhaps because he witnessed the two of us naysayers enjoying our work. Despite the fact that our knees were sore, our elbows were raw, and our entire faces were covered in dirt, we spent most of the time under the house laughing. Perhaps it was the horrid stench of sewage that lingered in the air, perhaps it was the great company, or just perhaps it was God's pure joy. Joy that couldn't have been realized without first accepting what he had asked us to do. God had called us so that we could be blessings, so that we could experience his joy. If I recall correctly, we spent nearly two days under that house, not whining, not complaining, laughing, getting to know one another, realizing that God calls us to do his work, not to be called his servants, but to be called his friends so that we can experience the true value of his joy. So to what is God calling us? God is calling us to go so that we can experience his joy and experience it fully. Amen. Bring a wire. This is very cool. And what else is cool is I can see everyone. So good morning, everybody. I'm glad to see you. So... I was asked to speak about the mission uh, here <clears throat> and address uh, a couple of questions that Rob mentioned. Um, and the first one, let me tell you about is, um, <clears throat> where is God working? <clears throat> Pardon me. Well, obviously, God works everywhere. But bringing that closer, closer to home, God certainly is working in Howard County. And I'm sure that um, any one of you could probably name, just right off the top of your head, mission projects that um, are going on in Howard County and that Glenmar is probably involved in. But the one that is close to my heart is the Day Resource Center in Jessup that is run by um, Grassroots. Now, the way I got into this was um, a very lovely lady in, um, at, at Glenmar approached me one day and said, would you like to help me feed the homeless? We're starting a, you know, a group. And I said, okay. I had no idea what I was getting into. And so I said, oh, okay, I'll help you. And um, she just reeled me in, just like a wide mouth, ba mouth bass. In fact, I think I still have the scar in my mouth from that fish hook. But um, it was a blessing to be reeled in. And uh, we worked with Jenny at, uh, at an older building down the, in, um, uh, on Route 1. And there was, it was 
it was frightening sometimes because this was 2008 when the um, economy tanked. And there were so many people who had lost their jobs and then lost their homes and their cars and their health insurance. And it was um, just frightening. And it was, you felt so sad for them. And to s try to do something for them is what the day center was trying to do. And if you're not familiar with the day center, um, it's, uh, it provides um, warm food, well, except in the summertime, it's cold, but a, a balanced meals. It provides a place where people can stay. Uh, it provides um, showers, free laundry facilities. Um, we have drivers of the of vans who go and pick the people up at, and, uh, at specific places and take them back. And uh, we have a pantry where they can get non-perishable foods and uh, used clothing. We also, in those early days, we also gave out tents and sleeping bags and propane heaters and just everything that we possibly could get our hands on to help these people make it through the hard times. So our team, our team has is, um, been working, we work every month um, and we go down there with the nine or ten people and we do all these jobs and we serve the food and we interact with the people and this has been going on every month for 11 years. A lot of the people who started out who had, uh, in 2008 um, have, uh, most of them, thank the Lord, have uh, moved on. They got jobs, they got housing, and got their uh, sense of worth back and their dignity, and they left, and we don't see them anymore, and we're happy about that because it means that they are thriving. But it never stops. There are always people in need. And uh, I think the, uh, one of the other questions that um, God is calling us to do, or at least I feel our team is being called um, to deepen our, our commitment to the, the day center and um, expand our team so that we can provide more services and um, to be able to get to help them um, in the areas that they really need. So thank you very much for listening this morning, and God bless you. Uh, my name is Dan Kege. Uh, I've been a member of Glenmar for 35 years. And yes, I've gone on a few of those uh, mission trips to Hurley and a few other places. I've uh, been over, over 25 of them, I think, over the past 20 years or so. And you know, they do change your life, that's for sure. Um, and, and I did it when, uh, I guess my turning point thing was, I did it when my kids were already past the age to go with me. So I was going just as a single, you know, father, but not with my children. So, uh, and I got talked into doing it by D.C. So, but the mission uh, that I want to talk to you today is um, sleep in heavenly peace. And you'll probably know it more by its motto, which no kid sleeps on the floor in my town, right? And uh, this is not just a Glenmar ministry. This is a national uh, charity. It's a, 50, a national 503C. Um, and I think it's important to know how it started. A guy in Idaho realized that a neighbor child was sleeping on the floor. He organized a family event to build this bed. And by the way, he borrowed the tools from his wife. Okay. <laughs> when he delivered the bed, the child's joy just overwhelmed his heart. And he thought, well, maybe there's some other kids out there that maybe you know, are sleeping on the floor. So he put a post on Facebook, and to his shock and surprise, not only were a lot of responses coming back that there were other children sleeping on the floor, but there was a many, many more people that responded back saying, we want to help build beds for people that are sleeping on the floor. So to make the story kind of a little shorter, 
uh, not too long after that, he quit his job. He started this charity. And over the last eight years, there are now over 200 uh, county or city chapters in the United States of Sleep in Heavenly Peace, one of which is Howard County, Howard County's chapter. Now, so how did Glenmar get involved in this? Um, every year, we talked about, we have hundreds of kids and adults that go to Hurley and, and other mission areas that are outreach. And they all, you know, now these, all these adults, it's, it's literally hundreds every year. And at, over, say, the last 20 years, that's a lot of people that are pretty good with tools, right? And they all come back with one kind of, of response, which is, why, do I, why can I only do this once a year? You know, why do I only, how can I only serve once a year? We get together, we do this major thing that's 12 hours away or whatever. Uh, how come I can't do something locally, right? So, my oldest daughter, who grew up in this church, who's now in her 40s, and didn't go to Hurley, she's in Portland, Oregon, calls me up one day and says, Dad, I got this ministry for you. She saw it on television, and it turns out it was one of the CNN top 10 hero uh, types of hometown hero uh, charities, and she had seen it there, and, and she told me all about it, and, you know, I took, kind of took it in, and next thing you know, I see it on the news myself, and uh, God started working on that, right? Um, to kind of make the story, uh, you know, uh, which over, happened over the next five months a little shorter, uh, God wouldn't let that go. Um, God is relentless sometimes. And he finally led me to a, uh, a bed build in Harford County. So last November, I drove up to the Pennsylvania line to a barn in the middle of nowhere and introduced myself to the lady in charge. And she says, what a coincidence. <laughs> yeah, you need coincidence. I don't believe in coincidence, by the way. I believe in God incidents, but not coincidences. She said, you should speak to the guy over there in the blue shirt. And uh, says he is just became the Howard County chapter president two weeks ago. Well, that meeting led to Howard County's first bed build, which was the the uh, Martin Luther King Service Day. So we have pushed the 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 uh, the organization in Howard County to get it started. It was this church that basically gave it the in encouragement to do that because of of Martin Luther King Service Day. On that day, we built about, um, I think it was 20-some beds. Um, and when I say we, I really mean you built those beds, right? It was, it was your financial um, gifts, and it was your volunteer work, and it was all the donations of, of new twin sheets and comforters that, uh, that, that supported those beds. Then on March 30th, we did another 30 beds, and then a little bit later, we boldly planned even a bigger build in June on uh, Father's Day weekend. Uh, we built another 50 beds over that weekend as a, a, to, build, to support a program called Beds Across America, where 5,000 beds were built that one weekend by Sleep in Heavenly Peace. All these have come through Glenmar's support. Financial, hands-on volunteers that build beds, and do donations of new twin beds, twin bedding. So far, Sleep in Heavenly Peace has built 136 beds and rescued 136 children off the floor. But you really can't, um, if you haven't been either building beds or, or been on a delivery team where you actually go in and deliver the beds to, to the child's home, you really can't imagine the impact that, that that happens, the physical, the mental, and the emotional impact of those children. It's a very lasting impact. And you, you saw the pictures roll by, you saw the smiles. I have 136 pictures, and every one of them, that child is smiling, you know. And uh, by the way, there's, there's presently about 50 people on the waiting list, 50 children waiting on the waiting list in Howard County for beds. Would you believe that in Howard County, there's, there's a waiting list that we can't keep up with? So the next picture is 
there's uh, the 40 volunteers that showed up for the morning shift uh, of the June 15th build, and because that was a large build, and the, and the, the slide after that is the 30 or so volunteers that showed up for the afternoon shift, where we built completely from scratch, from wood that was donated from by Lowe's, uh, all the way to, to beds that were stained, right? All the way. So uh, it's, it's a big effort. And we get, we get uh, comments from children all the time um, thanking us for, for building the beds. Uh, one of them you'll see here on, on, a, on a slide, but I think my favorite came from Dave and uh, Valerie Eddy, who I, I go to the 930 service. Uh, they heard a friend sharing about a neighbor child who had said, some church cared so much that they made me a bed. You know, you are that some church, right? The next uh, Glenmar uh, Sleep in Heavenly Peace build is going to be November the 16th. Uh, you can sign up out, out in the uh, Narthex to volunteer. You can donate money for, wo for food and, uh, or not food, wood and mattresses. Or if you like to shop, you can um, donate twin sheets and comforters. Everything that we pr provide the children is brand new. Um, there'll be someone out, the crew out on the, at, the, at the table or myself in the gathering place. Uh, my wife says that everything, every time I do something, there's always a bottom line. And, uh, and the bottom line is, is really this. Luke Mickelson in Idaho, eight years ago, felt a calling. He provided a bed for a neighbor child, one bed for a neighbor child. And in only just a few years, there's been over 22,000 children got off the floor by beds across the United States. It's a life-altering effect. Of course, you, you know, this is, a, this is a huge success, and your ministry doesn't have to be something that's like that. I mean, a, a successful ministry can be just a one-on-one. -on -one. doesn't matter. But the bottom line is if you feel a call, answer the call. Uh, you know, I, I got this particular call from my daughter in Portland, right? That's what started it, and God wouldn't let it go, right? Um, Sleep in Heavenly Peace always needs volunteers. No experience necessary. There's a sign-up out there. Uh, you, but be a participant in in some church event, you know, ministry of some kind. Be in service. Love is to be in service, right? Be active. Um, take seriously Jesus' command. Love God by following the command that he gave, love thy neighbor. Um, as part of a personal study that I'm, you know, Bible study that I do all the time, I'm reading uh, uh, one of Rick Warren's books, and, and I just kind of want to end with a, Line. He was talking. He talks a lot about servanthood, and he t he talks about uh, the difference between uh, servant leadership and uh, and he says that the the road for servant servant leadership is relatively full, but the field for servants is wide open. So, the call to really be in a, in a servant in servant you know, be the, the Christ servant is always there. Amen. Hi. My name is Molly Sellers, and I went to the Baltimore Mission Camp for the first time this year. I'm a seventh grader at El Camille's Middle School, and I have two parents who are sitting over there named Chad and Jen Sellers, and one little sister who is sitting over there and sang with the praise band earlier named Leah. As I think you all know, as I already mentioned, I'm here to talk about the Baltimore Mission Camp. I saw God working in many people, including me. I saw God in my group mates, Olivia, Paige, Matthew, Nathan, and Cece. I also saw God working in my dad, Holly, and Lisa, my three chaperones, you could say. I saw this when we went to Little Flowers, and everyone was playing with the kids, and the kids were having so much fun. We played this one game, where the kids were the cops, 
and we were the robbers. If we did one thing at all, they would say, you're going to jail. Only we would get out of jail by making them catch another criminal. For example, my dad. He was always in jail. Also, at Art with a Heart, we made some origami things. We weren't supposed to take anything home, but the dude at the origami station said that we could. So I saw God in him because I knew, he knew that we worked very hard on them. And we were kids. We wanted to take them home. At Art with a Heart, we also made pop art to put on trash cans to make Baltimore more beautiful. And we made glass art that Art with a Heart is going to sell and use the money to help with the jobs program. On the first day, we went out to Baltimore and we had $5 to give out to people. When we went around, I saw God in me, Cece, and my dad, my group members. We went around and gave out money for people to pay for their parking, as well as gave out lunches that my group made. I also figured out what Han meant, thanks to a very nice lady that was a shop owner in Hampton. She also helped me figure out why there were so many flamingos in Hampton. Only, when we were starting to get done, a storm came around. It got crazy windy. And we, when we got back to the cars, our car driver wasn't there. So Lisa and the people in her, her car let us squeeze in so we didn't have to stand out in the terrible weather. I saw God and Lisa because of this. God is changing all of us in many ways. He even changed me. Before I went to Baltimore Mission Camp, I thought homeless people were just dirty, rude people. But now I understand that they aren't that. They can be kind and helpful, and they're not that rude. I also saw a change in how I see the world. Before, I didn't really think about homeless people and poor people. But now I know that God loves them just like me, and the world is a world filled with kind and loving people. People who care, people who love, and people who make the world a better place. God is calling me to go on other mission trips, too. When I get older, I'll go on overnight mission trips with my dad. And when Leah gets old enough, I'll go on overnight mission trips with her, too. Thank you for listening. Well, good morning. Um, before I go any further, I, I, I want to start with the music that we had today. And that last song, Trust Without Borders, that puts me here today in front of you uh, where God has called me to step out of that comfort zone, to hear his call, his nudging, his pulling. Um, my name is Brian Robb. I've been a Glen, uh, member here at Glenmar for the last 20 years. Uh, the last 15, I have been part of the children's ministry team. Um, I teach fifth grade, and I see a lot of faces out there. Um, this says Hurley Mission Trip. We will get there. But first, I would kind of like want to set the stage as to what it is to be called into ministry and, and what God is asking of us. Um, you know, this is our minis uh, mission ministry weekend, and we are blessed to be a blessing. But it is also something that calls you um, out from where you might think that you were comfortable and then you're a little uncomfortable until you come home. And then, I forget who said it, you're ready to go back. You're just ready to go back. Um, mission work kind of reminds me of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Um, he reaches out to his people and he says, you know, if you ask, it'll be given to you. And if you seek, you'll find it. Knock and the door will open. But the question is that you have to ask yourself is, are you listening to those nudges? Are you listening to God who's calling you? And sometimes that's one of the most difficult things to do. Um, I liken it to, uh, you ever been at the mall or a store or wherever, when you see a little toddler running around with his parents, tugging on the mother's hem of her dress or the father's pants, keep on nagging and nagging and nagging, but the parent just keeps on doing whatever they're doing. They know they're there. They know the child is there. But it's the time when the child really says, hmm, that you turn and you recognize and you notice. God is not going to kick you um, into submission and say, you need to serve. That's not our God. But what we have to do is we have a responsibility before God 
to answer those calls. And so how do we answer those calls? Well, Glenmore Church has several, several missions that you can be involved in. You don't have to go overseas. You don't even have to travel eight hours to Hurley. Uh, there is plenty, just like Dan said, there are plenty of opportunities right here in our own backyard. And as you accept those calls that God gives you, and you do answer, your growth then will begin and end with Jesus. There's nothing that you need in between because he covers it all, everything. We are here and we are made to glorify God through our actions. And mission is just one of those ways that we can accomplish that. He engineers our circumstances. It's up for us to answer that call. So ask yourself, how is God nudging you today? Where is he calling you? How is he asking you to step out with trust without borders? Um, we have to step out. It's our responsibility to do so. But you as a Christian, and as you grow, you will see that. You will feel that. I did not start doing mission work probably until about five years ago, although I've been a, school, uh, a Sunday school teacher. I felt the call. Day of mission started one year coming for one hour, the next year for five hours, the next year the entire time slinging 75-pound bags of soybean and rice and all that good stuff. But it's what we're supposed to do. It's God's will, God's word, and God's work are permanent. It's up to us to answer that. So, I recently just went on the Hurley mission trip for the very first time. And I will say, as I'm looking around here, I see a lot of faces that were with me. I see even actually members of my crew team. Hannah, Prem, you were on my team. And we were actually working one day. Uh, we were putting on a tin roof in Hurley. And we showed up at the house. We knocked on the door. The homeowner was completely surprised that we were there. The materials were all laid in the yard. Homeowner kind of looks at us. Well, what are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here till next Wednesday. Oh, well, engineering oversight. So homeowner said, okay, well, you're here. Let's go ahead and get it done. So he had to call off and cancel the appointments he had for that day um, because he wanted to help. Um, and we were glad that he helped. Now, set the stage. This is Hurley, Virginia, southwestern Virginia, end of June. It was hot. I mean, that day was like 90 degrees up on the roof. It was probably over 100. So we were taking a break for lunch, and we got down off the roof, and the homeowner was a, uh, he loved horses. Uh, he raised horses. Uh, he and his brothers through the years used to do equestrian shows, things of that nature. And he walked into this old, beat-up barn, uh, had a tack room. Um, he went in and sat down. So I, I went in with him. And, and he and I sat there on two dirty chairs, you know, just trying to get cooled down, you know, drinking lots of water. And we just started jabbering back and forth. And during that conversation, I'm not quite sure exactly what happened, but I looked at him and I said, how's your faith? Now, for somebody that has not seen the trust without borders and trying to witness to folks, it's a very difficult thing, and it becomes very personal as you grow in your faith. But I'm telling you, it just came out. And that homeowner looked at me, and he said, my faith is just fine. He says, what I struggle with is the way that other people and other churches in my own community, treat each other. He said, that's, to me, that's not the way it's supposed to be. That's not faith. He says, you and I sitting here right now, and this is one of the most profound things that I've ever heard, and it touched me deeply, and I have shared this over and over and over again, and I think about it almost every day. He said, you and I, right now, we're having church. We're sitting here talking about Christ. We're having church. And I looked at him and I said, immediately, I went to the Gospel of Matthew and I said, you know what Christ told us? Where two or more gather in my name, I too will be there. We were having church. So think about it the next time that you sit with a friend, two friends, five friends, a hundred friends. It doesn't matter. If you are experiencing and sharing the love of God, and if you are glorifying our Father in heaven by your love in Christ, he is there with you. 
And he is asking you to basically get up and go and serve. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing this morning your testimonies of transformation. You know, I was thinking that the mission of the United Methodist Church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And we believe that there is deeply embedded within each of us a call of God's grace to partner with God to transform the world. And sometimes that looks like receiving a shirt. Sometimes that looks like going to a place that you're very unfamiliar with where there might even be some old school gas pumps. <laughs> and sometimes that means doing something you would have never, ever dreamed of, like crawling under a house. But you know something? Each of us are invited to experience God's grace and to be partnered with God to transform lives so that God's kingdom on earth might be realized.